So now we'll be discussing about simple storage service. So under this lesson, we would be understanding about what is S3, what are buckets and objects, how can we control the excess of S3 buckets or the objects. Okay, what if I don't want to uh, make my object publicly accessible? What if I want to keep it private? Or what if I want to give the access to certain people? Then in that case, we have to use this access control methods that we are going to discuss. Then there's interesting feature of S3 called as access points. We'll be discussing about that later. Encryption options. So there are three encryption options over here. We have SSE S3, we have SSE KMS, and we have SSE C. These are the three different types of options that we have for S3. Then we have different storage classes. So these storage classes will be giving us the trade-off between the latency and the cost. So if you want the lowest latency possible, then you have to pay on the higher end. And if you think that, okay, your data is not frequently accessed and it's okay if it takes time to access that data, then you can just store the data into one particular storage class and the cost would be less. So there are different storage classes that we are going to discuss. Then we have something called as versioning, which allows us to maintain multiple version of the same object. We'll be talking about the lifecycle policies to actually transfer our objects into different storage classes according to some rules that we design. Then we have replication of S3 object for making our data durable. We'll be talking about multi-part upload and event notification. So as you can see, we have a lot to cover into this particular module. So let's get started with the first concept that is what basically S3 is. So S3 is nothing but it is simple storage service. And as we already discussed, this is object based service, right? Object storage service, which is being provided to us by AWS. Now, as I told that it is highly scalable and durable. So by default, when you are storing your data inside of S3, okay, it is replicated into three different availability zones. So that's why your data is durable. Even if one AZ is going down, your data can be fetched from another AZ. And why do we call it scalable is because as I told, we can store virtually infinite amount of data into these buckets. The only restriction over here is that you can be having the maximum size of object as five terabytes. So one object can be as large as five terabyte, one object, okay? Now, you can store such objects, as many objects as you want inside of your bucket. So you can store and retrieve any amount of data at any time from anywhere on the web. So this doesn't mean that your bucket always needs to be, you know, uh, publicly accessible. If you want, you can make it private as well. Okay. The next thing is S3 is designed for 99.9999 and so on durability. Meaning that it is highly resistant to data loss. The chances of losing your data which is being stored on S3 is almost negligible. Right? Your data won't be lost. So what this 11.9 uh, basically means, th this is called as 11.9 because if you count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So it is 11 nines of durability. Okay, so what that basically means. So 11 nines basically means that this is per year durability, okay. 
So that basically means that we can have 31.5 seconds of downtime. Only 31.5 seconds of downtime per year. These 9 represents the availability or the percentage of uptime. Okay. So achieving this 11 lines of durability is extremely difficult. As you can see, only downtime would be 31.5 seconds per year, right? So this will require redundant hardware, software, network infrastructure to minimize the risk of failures and to ensure continuous operations. So as I already told that our data is being replicated in three AZs, that's how S3 can achieve this 11 lines of availability or say durability, right? So what are the use cases for S3 where we can use this object storage? So you can think it, think of it as a infinite storage, right? So if you want to use it for backup and restore purpose, suppose you have your data on-prem and from there you want to store your data on S3 for the backup purposes, then that would be a very good use case for S3. Even internally, few of the AWS services use S3 for the backup purposes. It also is used for login purpose, uh, logging purpose. Okay, so all the logs which are being generated is in the backend stored into S3 by few of the AWS services as well. Apart from that, it can be used as data lake for analytics. So suppose you are having a huge data set, okay, and you want to do or you want to perform analysis on that. So you need some storage space, right? So that storage space can be uh, given to us by S3 or you can utilize S3 for creating your data lakes where you can store semi-structured or unstructured kind of data. We also have a service called as Athena. Okay, AWS Athena, which is not uh, the part of this course, but if you want to analyze your data, uh, which is stored in being S3, right, then also you can analyze with the help of this particular service of AWS. Then we have media storage. So any kind of media like uh, MP4s or MP3s that can be stored over here in S3 because we have a very higher end of object size restriction as well. So you can store maximum object of 5 TB over here. If you want to use S3 for creating a static website, then also you can do it. So this can be done within few clicks, right? So into S3, you just have to configure, you just have to enable static website and you just have to give your index.html page and error.html page over there. And you can just use S3 bucket as your static website as well. You can also use this for the archiving data purposes. Suppose you have to archive your data for the compliance reasons, right? Like hospital data is there. So they need to store the patient details for, you know, five years or seven years. So those type of archiving data requirements, if they are there, then at the very low cost, you can store that data onto S3 using the correct storage class. We would be discussing about storage class very soon into the slides. The next topic is buckets and objects. So we are saying that uh, the S3 would be storing the data. So how it would store the data? So it would be storing the data into buckets. So buckets are nothing, but uh, you can consider that as a virtual container inside of which we can store our objects. Okay, what is object? Object is nothing but the file. So object would be having uh, the object name. We would be having the object ID, the metadata related to it, and the content of the file. So, S3 employs a bucket-based architecture for storing the objects. So, to access both buckets and object, we have to regulate it, okay, according to the specific user requirements. So, we can decide 
who can access the bucket who can access the object inside of it now if i am storing my data inside of the bucket then one thing to understand over here is these buckets are actually the flat namespace you cannot create uh, you know the directory like structures over there but you can actually create um something called as prefixes so prefixes are as good as folders you can understand okay but in the back end it would be the flat namespace so you can create the prefix so if in one object i want to store you know multiple uh, categories of the data for example i'm having some accounting firm and i have multiple departments with me then i can use one single bucket i can create multiple buckets okay but if it into one single bucket i want to store multiple categories of data like uh, one should be for marketing data okay other data is for sales the next data is for taxation and uh, etc right so if i want to store different kind of data i can create different prefixes prefixes are as good as folders so i'll be creating the folders inside of which i'll be storing the data related to marketing the data related to sales the data related to tax so this is the bucket without object this is the bucket with objects right now we do have the object and let us suppose that this object is called as pub.jpg so how this how this object can be accessed so we do have the url as the buckets and the objects you know objects specifically can be accessed through the internet as well so we need the url for the same right so url would be something like this my bucket is your bucket name and later this is same for every bucket okay s3.amazonaws.com would be same for each and every bucket this is the prefix that we have created and this is the file name or the object name that we have so this would be the s3 url now because s3 is accessible from internet and it can also be used for hosting static website the name of your s3 bucket would be acting as a domain because of that reason your s3 bucket name should be unique unique globally okay you cannot have bucket name which is already inside of your account or already present in someone else account so it should be globally unique right the next thing is access control now bucket can either have public access or it can have private access or controlled access so let us understand what is public access over here so this is the owner of the bucket and this is everyone else okay if my bucket is publicly accessible okay then the owner of the bucket will definitely have the access to this bucket but everyone else as well can access the bucket and the objects inside of it okay it again depends up to the policy that we have attached with this bucket if you remember we have the resource based policies right so we can attach a bucket policy with this and we can also restrict when even if it is public access okay and if i want to give specific actions only like i just want everyone to get the objects out of it i don't want to uh, allow everyone else to put the objects or to delete the objects so that also is kind of possible we'll be seeing the bucket policy example very soon into the next slide now the next topic is private access so when it is the private access then what will happen the owner of the bucket can access the objects inside of it and the bucket itself 
but everyone else okay this is everyone they won't be allowed to access anything and by default all the buckets have private access okay lastly we have the controlled access so this is what i was talking about like you know if i want even if the access if the you know bucket is uh, if some people i want to allow to access to this bucket so let's say out of these three this is roy this is jay and this is shruti okay and this is the owner of the bucket so owner of the bucket by default would be having the access to the bucket right because if uh, the owner is not having the access it doesn't make any sense but suppose from here i just want roy and jay to have the access to this bucket i don't want shruti to access this bucket so that also can be done so there are these three types of accesses that we can have the public access where the bucket is publicly accessible by default our buckets would be private so only the owner of the bucket would be accessing our bucket and the objects and lastly we would be having the controlled access where we can control that who can access the bucket so how to get this controlled access so for getting the controlled access we have to create the resource based policy for our bucket okay this would be resource based policy if you remember we have two types of policy the identity based policy and the resource based policy right into identity based policy principal so there are the components of these policy like version statement effect principal action etc so principal is the optional parameter or optional component and into resource based policy resource is the optional one okay if you give it fine if you do not want to give the resource parameter into the policy then also it's okay because it is directly attached to the resource and because identity based policy is attached to the principal itself so that's why it becomes optional over here right we can also have the conditions in your policy which again is the optional thing to have so effect actions these are some of the parameters which are you know the compulsory parameters right so when we are creating the bucket policy so this bucket policy would be attached with particular bucket so you have the ability to establish and adjust the bucket policy which will allow you to decide who is authorized to access your s3 bucket and the object stored inside of it right and these are categorized under resource based policy so you can see the example over here we have given the version we have given the statement over here right what this bucket policy is doing it is allowing us it is allowing something to whom it is allowing to what principle because this is a wild card it means that allow everyone so what are the actions that we are allowing we are allowing to list the buckets and we are also allowing to get the object inside of that bucket so because we are allowing the list bucket it means that first of all we need to see the bucket on the bucket console right on the s3 console so that's why the resource that we are saying is document example bucket and inside of that every object should be accessible because we have also given get object action so that's why we are giving a slash and a star star means wild card it means that access everything inside of this document example bucket so if you attach this policy with any of the bucket okay so while creating the bucket you can assign the policy or even after creating the bucket you can edit the policy and you can assign this so if this policy is attached to the bucket then everyone okay this this will become a public access so anyone and everyone can list the object and get the objects from document example bucket so this is about the bucket policy 
So when we are having, as I told you that we can have a bucket shared between multiple departments, right? We have taken the example during the prefix, right? So sales department can have data inside of a bucket. Marketing department can have, right? Taxation data can be there. So multiple department data is there inside of the same bucket, okay? So we can have the shared data sets that are being accessed by, you know, various teams, individuals and applications for analysis, machine learning, real-time monitoring or anything for any purpose. So managing the access, like for example, the sales data should be only accessible by the sales team. Okay. The marketing data is only accessible by marketing team. The tax data should be only accessible by CAs of the firm, let's say. So if I want such kind of, you know, managed access, then one single bucket policy would become, you know, very cumbersome to manage. If I, if I put so many aspects into one single bucket policy for controlling the access, then it would become very tedious for me. So managing the bucket policy will become difficult, time consuming, and it will be very complex. And also bucket policy is having the restriction of 20 KP. So we know that the policies are the JSON documents, right? So this JSON should not exceed 20 KP of size. So if you are having such a complex structure where one bucket is being shared by multiple teams and we want to restrict the excesses, right? Then in that case, we might exceed this 20 KB limit as well. So to alleviate these changes, what we want is we want some feature and that feature is called as S3 access point. So this helps us simplify the data access for any AWS service or customer application who is storing data in S3. So we can have unique access control policy for each access point. So what I can do is I can create one access point for sales team. I can create one access point for marketing data. I can create one access point for taxation data, which is stored inside of the same S3 bucket. But I can just, you know, this is just can be understood as a, I can, I'm just creating different partitions, right? If we are using one book for, uh, you know, many subjects, one notebook for writing the notes of many subjects, then what we generally do, we fold one page and we just write the subject name over there, right? So the same thing can be thought for the access points as well. So this is the diagrammatical way in which you can understand it. So you can see that we have the finance team who would be assuming the finance role, right? It is not compulsory to give roles over here. You can also create the policy according to the, um, let's say tags or tags given to them, right? That can also be done. But right now we are just assuming that they would be having finance role, the finance team would be assuming the finance role. When they are assuming the finance role, they'll be putting their request to one specific access point. Okay, access point would be, let's say this access point would be called as finance access point. Inside of which we are allowing only data to be accessed is of finance and tax prefix. Into the document example bucket, I have the four prefixes, okay, four folders, one for finance, another for sales, for marketing, for tax. Finance team would be only allowed to access finance and tax data. How can I put this restriction? With the help of access point policy. So with each access point, we can have access point policy attached to it, right? So this is the example of access point policy, right? So you have the version, you have statement. So into the statement effect is allowed. The principle is this one. 
okay we are putting what we are allowing we are allowing the action of putting the object so we have the resource over here we are saying that to this access point we are allowed to put the object when the user is Roy and the object tag is finance so we can also apply the tags to the objects so this is the object okay we can apply a tag to it correct so this is about access point policy example so if the tag of that object okay the key would be data and the value would be finance if the object is having this particular tag, then only Roy will be able to put the object, right? Or here it would be better if we have get the object, okay? So Roy will be able to get the object if the tag associated with that object is of finance. 